Uh, we have uh, Dr. Miller next, and uh, followed by Dr. Hochberg, and then a break. My name is Paul Miller, and I uh, uh, have been in this field a long time. I'm back up once. Um, and I'm a very active practitioner. I'm a nephrologist, actually, by formal training, and migrated into metabolic bone disease through the kidneys um, and um, do a lot of work in that particular area. Uh, uh, but I see uh, about 80 patients a week. I'm a very active practitioner, a lot of complicated people. Um, I'm with a group now of wonderful big orthopedic surgeons that are learning metabolic bone disease and how to incorporate all the things that we're teaching them here into this, and they give me a lot of support, and I wanted to thank them for my research um, and uh, other support that they have. These are my disclosures. Um, the, um, so the summary of the findings, when they, I was asked to present this uh, more clinical uh, approach, uh, I think some of these are, are critical and, and just don't get addressed very well. Asking patients if they've ever had a low trauma fracture is an important component of the medical history that frequently we don't, um, we don't uh, ask. Um, height measurements and doing spine x-rays or VFA on those patients with a loss of height of more than an inch and a half should become a standard of care and maybe should be a quality measure for payment. The diagnosis of osteoporosis based on fracture trumps T-scores. That's not a political comment. It's simply the fact that regardless what the bone density is, the presence of a low trauma fractures makes the diagnosis regardless of the T-score. And that important cannot, that statement cannot be uh, overemphasized more because of the fact that we have a huge problem in clinical implementation of insurance companies denying payment because the patient doesn't have osteoporosis the three score certainly does not trump fractures. Fractures make the diagnosis, period. And there are many diseases that we treat that have impairment bone quality, uh, that, which is the other half of bone strength that we can't measure in clinical practice, such as diabetes or people on steroids or people with uh, more severe chronic kidney failure who fracture because they have a bone quality issue. And fractures demand a secondary workup and treatment. Not all kinds of fractures are postmenopausal or male osteoporosis. We have to think about other diseases that can cause fractures, such as osteogenesis imperfecta or osteomalacia, or some of the rare bone diseases that we follow very carefully as well, such as TIO or hypophosphatasia. This was the NIH definition of osteoporosis that was printed and published in 2000. And today here in 2018, it still stands firm. A skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength predisposing to an increased risk for fracture. Bone strength is a composite of bone density, which we can measure, and bone quality, which we can't measure in clinical practice. Terregular bone score gives us an indicator, but is certainly imperfect. So bridging the gap, research knowledge to practice, I've, I've divided this into the left-hand side of what research shows and to the right-hand side where the gaps are. One, research has shown definitely that specific low trauma fractures in patients 50 years of age and older is the single greatest risk factor for a second fracture. The gap, practice gap, most physicians don't even grasp this message. It's not impugning the busy physician that Dr. Gill sees with all the primary care problems that they do. It's simply that the message has not gotten through. They do not look for the asymptomatic vertebral compression fracture, and again, don't know that fractures are the key to making the diagnosis above and beyond whatever bone density number is there. Two, the research has shown that treat the 50 year of age or older with either gender fracture with pharmacological therapy, again, independent of the bone density number. And a lot of this is addressing the, the payer uh, denials and problems. And of course, Dan Solomon's great data shows the falling rate of pharmacological treatment even for a hospitalized patient with a hip fracture and hopefully FLS implementation might address this. 
This is one of many studies that show that a low trauma fracture in this particular study by Coltsbilcher, wrist, vertebrae, and hip predict fractures at other skeletal sites, whether it be soft, whether it be our NORA data in terms of Collie's fractures. The fracture is symbolic of systemic skeletal fragility, and that's how I convey that to patients. I only had a wrist fracture, doctor, but yes, you have a high risk for hip fractures as well. And that is a message that needs to be conveyed in a more, in, with greater articulation. Research in gaps treatments. Research is unequivocal evidence that pharmacological therapy with FDA approved agents reduces the risk of fracture in postmenopausal women, in men, and in glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. Fear, the bisphosphonate, and this has been addressed many times. Atypical femur fracture, irresponsible media hype. It was March the 10th, 2010, has really killed bisphosphonates with fear trickling over into all other therapies. The patients that I want to think about, the Nasimab, ask me if that's a similar compound and doesn't do the same things, and I'm afraid to take it. It's a challenge. I was in San Antonio, Texas at the ISCD annual meeting when this came on ABC Evening News that night on the Thursday. I got home and I had 88 phone calls waiting for me Monday morning about patients stopping their bisphosphonates. And in, in all due respect, our science and our professional societies have not been successful in mitigating this fear. And that's a challenge for all of us, no matter what organizations that we're devoted to, and most of us are devoted to all the ones, ASBMR and the NOF, the NBHA, the AC Room, ISED, and go on, to work together to address this uh, terrible issue. Research and gaps. Research has shown that even asymptomatic vertebral compression fracture is associated with a high risk for subsequent vertebral and non vertebral fractures in untreated patients. Providers do not measure height accurately or look for vertebral compression fracture by x-ray or VFA, even if patients have lost an inch and a half or more from what they thought they were. And I think the gap in this here is that most patients are, are measured by the MA, the, the medical assistant in the office. And they put down, and they, and they may not have to know how to do it correctly. And they put down the number on a chart that gets back to the doctor without even being highlighted that this might be a particular of concern. I'd like to see the ability of the MA who measures the height to automatically be able to order the x-ray so they can do it right there at the point of care if somebody has fulfilled that criteria. That would be a bigger major step forward. Right now, it's not allowed in the, uh, in the healthcare system. This is a, a picture on the left of the late Betsy McClung um, doing her measurements accurately on a stadiometer on a patient who was totally asymptomatic but had lost three inches in height. And the x-ray to the right shows the vertebral compression fracture. Changes the diagnosis, changes the risk, changes the management if that is found. So I think uh, Richard probably showed some of these from the, the UK. Uh, the, the, we worked very hard with multiple organizations to get Medicare to cover these for certain indications of when to do an X-ray or a VFA. And certainly somebody with a height loss ought to be number one. I mean, I, we miss that all the time. Um, the steroid stuff, Ken can talk about more later. But these are some of the indications that are reimbursed currently for when to do these measurements. This is from the NOF guidelines. Though NOF, though often unrecognized, identification of vertebral fractures is important. A vertebral fracture, clinical or morphometric, is the indication for pharmacological treatment. Once the workup for secondary causes, including things that we see commonly, celiac disease and other kind of issues, are ruled out. The consequences of these fractures are enormous. We deal with these day in and day out. They have an increased risk for falls. They may have no pain, but they've lost uh, balance. Uh, they're going to have more fractures if they're untreated. And there's a high mortality. This is a slide from the Dubos Australian population studies 
looking at survival by type of fractures in women on the left over a 10 year period, actually maybe up to 20 year period, um, under the age of 65, from 50 to 75, and men on the right. And the different colors, the different types of fractures, the, the blue being hip fractures, the green being vertebral fractures. And, and look at it, uh, this is not picking out but the, the men. The blue line shows their, their survival after a hip fracture. But look at the green line. In the earlier years, it's even faster and more, more mortality than hip fractures. And there are multiple reasons behind this. It may be the diseases that they accompany, but uh, we, the, the, these fractures are significant and we miss them and we can't take them lightly. Low BMD is a strong predictor for future fracture, yet DEX accessibility is declining. Despite the great recommendations of the United States Prevention Services Task Force and the U.S. Surgeon General's Office that all postmenopausal women obtain a BMD at age 65 regardless of risk factors, the number of DEXA machines available in the United States has declined by nearly 50% in freestanding facilities. In Colorado, we've lost half. If you don't have the machine, you can't test. You can't make a diagnosis, you're not gonna treat. Associated with the lower accessibility of DEXA machines, the number of people being screened for osteoporosis as a consequence. This is not case finding strategies. This is a recommendation for population screening. The number of people being treated has steadily declined. And the major reason for the decline in most uh, uh, osteoporosis diagnosis is the cut in DEXA reimbursement in 2012 from $124 to $34 for Medicare. This has never been a cash cow. If we could just get it to break even, we'd see this field turn around to some degree and membership in many societies increasing. This is the, the, the slide that you've seen before from Mike, and Mike Lewicki, and it, is, um, it just shows the trend. If you look at the light blue bars, Medicare reimbursement started to go down and then went down in 2012 to about $37, $38 for freestanding facilities. Hospital-based facilities, they kept the price the same. This was a broad radiological change for all radiological devices where reimbursement for hospital-based facilities was maintained, for freestanding facilities was cut. To me, that's discrimination. But the point is, is that if you have a machine with a break-even, and we've calculated this is about $90, and you're paying them 37, you can't keep it open. I'm blessed that I can keep my machines open because of my research grants, but I'm different, and I'm lucky, and I'm blessed for that. But this is what's happening, and what that trend have been diagnosis going down, number of people, uh, uh, DEXA testing going down, and of course, the number of people being treated going down. Age and risk. This was the first study, 1988. Connie Johnston, University of Indiana in the group, and so he, showing the relationship between low bone density, age, and fracture risk. So that the fracture risk doubles by decade of age at the same bone density. This is a great, this is a great landmark study. And it's been repeated many, many times by other, other, other work. There's a couple of points in here. First of all, if you take a look at the 50 to 59, it's pretty flat. It's a little increased. And our recommendations are guidelines, if you're postmenopausal where the average age is 51, and you have a T-score of minus 2.5 to treat. I, I think a healthy person doesn't want to get treated at 50. But the, but the, and those guidelines have to be changed. We're over-treating the low-risk people, and as you know, we're under-treating the high-risk people. So fracture risk doubles by decade from 50 forward, even at the same T-score. The reason for this well-documented relationship is due in part to increased fall risk and also deterioration in bone quality with age, which is half of the bone strength. There are no office-based bone quality measurement tools, and I would love to see all the great scientists that work in this area get together and develop some affordable office-based quality measurement. But the lack of the knowledge of the age-risk relationships leads to over-treatment of low-risk people and under-treatment of high-risk people. Fracks, 
We were on the Frax Committee. It's a great piece of work. But as we look back on it, try to, try to, try to use it, I think some of the, one of the greatest faults of Frax, if I can use that, is that it never captured fall data. It's a health economic model. Where if one was to reassess fracks with a drug price of $14, you treat everyone. And if you try to do this healthy economic model of when it becomes cost effective to treat, uh, uh, based on the price of the drug at $3,200, you treat no one. The insurance companies, and I put here non responsible, but I better use the word non accountable. I'm in front of patients where I'm accountable. Here's my face, here's my card, call me. If you don't like me, you can have your lawyer call me. But I'm accountable. And then all of a sudden we get denied our treatment by somebody who's not accountable. And that has to be, there needs to be a change in that. An example of the importance of falls, because now I spend half of my time with patients working on teach, teaching them fall methods. We have little balanced things. I get on them and show them how to do things. Because non-vertebral fractures occur after falls. If you reduce the risk of falls, we reduce the risk of non-vertebral fractures. So here's the FRAX data where a patient who was 85, a T-score of minus 25, four vertebral fractures, four falls. That's the FRAX number, obviously, without falls. The Garvin model, the Dubose model that captured falls is a much smaller study, I understand. You can see the impact of the falls on the uh, hip fractures and any osteoporotic fractures. Vertebral fractures occur while we're walking around Wisconsin Avenue, but non-vertebral fractures occur after falls. So research has shown that most non-vertebral fractures occur after falls, and most practitioners do not appreciate the fall issue. Research has shown that balance ability begins to decline from age 65 on. I can attribute to that. And that falls begin to increase also from age 65 on, and there's lots of data on this. Most providers do not test for balance in their office. It takes time. Or clinical sarcopenia, a grip strength. When I walk into the room, most patients stand up. I don't know if that's respect or, from, or whether or not I'm just getting older. But they stand up, and I watch them how they stand up and see if they can get out of a chair without using their hands. Simple things, observations that begin to make me think to focus on certain areas. And we discuss all kind of fall prevention strategies and get people into PT, yoga, Tai Chi, Pilates, anything at all that will keep in their minds the fact that they've got to uh, work on this particular issue. We don't spend enough time with this. Advise against the risky behavior of fall. This is a slide given me by Nelson Watts. We do this all the time. And we see patients do this all the time. And after you have fallen and you're broken, you go, boy, that was a stupid thing for me to do. But that's human behavior. The other thing about the steps that I wanted to point out is that we always point out to patients, what's the most dangerous step? Going down. It's the last step. They look, they're looking ahead. It blends into the floor. We see more lower extremity fractures with the last step. I'm going to write a little paper called The Last Step. So we have a lot of work to do with patients that, that doesn't cost a lot of money and doesn't expose them to medications, which I use a lot of. But the fall risk is something that needs to have a, a major emphasis in this particular area. Key recommendations, educate, train, and retrain all providers at a single low trauma fracture in either gender. And you can include the other major fractures that were captured in fracs. From age 50 on and older is the single most important risk factor for future fracture independent of the prevailing BMD or T-score. Height measurements and acting on substantial height loss should become a performance measurement for payment. Mitigating fear of all of our FDA-approved treatments for osteoporosis is a constant physician-patient dialogue. We spend so much time at this. Increased DEXA reimbursement to at least a break-even amount would be a huge step in the field. And fall prevention strategies that are maintained throughout life should be discussed annually from age 65 on. And with that, I'll end and say thank you very, very much for your
inviting me here to 